And our next guest is uh, Des Pagam. He is the head of um, architecture at the Lancaster Institute for the Contemporary Arts of Lancaster University. His field of interest, and here I quote from the website of Lancaster, inside engagement between industry, community, and academia is on optimization as an approach to problem solving through spatial and operational methodologies by using algorithmic and logistical software to improve communication and interaction. In practice, this involves multiple activities from the coordination of community consultation workshops to the facilitation of product or service development between user groups and the industries that provide them. So the speech that we're looking forward to comes with a title on authorship in the age of generative architectural design. And Mr. Fagan, uh, you are kindly invited to present us your work and ideas. Yeah, um, apologies for earlier. Um... It was an interesting segue though from the last talk about idiocy <laughs> because I clicked the wrong link. Um, but anyway, um, thank you um, very much uh, for um, kind of um, listening to my talk. So today I'm just going to talk about authorship in the age of generative architectural design. Um, a little bit about me. So um, I've worked on some um, quite interesting projects. Um, previously, I've been the project architect for the London Olympic Village 2012, where I was interested in the ways in which I can um, introduce um, unusual or unique forms to a, a very repeat element of the, the Olympic Village. Um, I've also worked at uh, Zardid's Architects as well, where I was project architect for the um, Glasgow Transport Museum, which was an interesting project because the, everything was unique on that, really. So. Um, yeah, so, and then uh, currently I'm head of architecture at Lancaster University, where I'm um, also course leader for the masters, um, and we're very interested in the future of education, machine learning, and artificial intelligence included. My work looks to unpick the ways in which um, the authorship of the architect or designer will change during um, adoption of computer processing, so primarily machine learning um, and its application to architectural design. So, for example, um, I'm currently with UNESCO testing, testing ways in which machine learning can mediate between the pressures of heritage, com Con, uh, conservation and commercial development on the other side for under threat um, UNESCO World Heritage Site buffer zones. But I'm not here to talk about that today. Today I'm going to talk about authorship, the, the concept of authorship in the age of generative architectural design. So I'd like to give a general introduction to how pa uh, pattern identification, which is obviously a key instrument in the toolkit of the architect, has, has developed in principle through early civilization. I'll then go on to discuss case studies of four primary issues really facing adoption, I think, in machine learning and architecture. So authenticity, bias, stagnation, and intellectual property. And I'll just conclude by calling, I suppose, on designers and educators to engage more fully with the new toolkit that machine learning processes provides in order to positively influence um, the development of design outcomes. So um, the first one, pattern identification. So mathematics, this is very general and broad based, but it's useful context. Mathematics is structurally based. So the principle of mathematics resides, I suppose, in its relational and transformational language, which gives rise to patterns. So a mathematical pattern may be described as a predictable regularity involving spatial or logical um, relationships. Um, mathematical, mathematical thinking relies on, on detecting both sameness and also difference and through classifying. So effectively in seeking, I suppose, one could say, one could say algorithms. So, for example, in, in this um, piece of research, children who seek out mathematical similarities and differences both within and between patterns are likely to develop a keener understanding of the structure of those patterns. And I suppose, you know, historically looking back in relation to patterns, builders in, in early human civilization divide up structural distances by piecing the building blocks of form together. And the discovery or adoption of patterns and construction provided um, a logical means to break down problems and to find solutions. For example, in this, this, this image to the span of a, a river, so breaking down um, kind of distances, or in other examples, for example, in the infill of a facade for or an ornamentation. So the, the codification of architectural form was, was formally adopted by the Greek, so etymologically through the, the word architect or master builder, so responsible both for the inception and drawing of design and for construction. 
Um, moving through the centuries, this role, this role of the architect would melt and fragment over time. But I think perhaps one of the, the most prolific polymaths in, in architectural history was Alberti, um, a humanist who stated that um, beauty consists in a, a, a quote, a rational integration of the proportions of all the parts where nothing can be added or taken away without destroying the harmony of the whole. So Alberti believed in the Vitruvian ideals of human scale. So his drawings and writings were, were mathematical, proportional and, and relational. Um, I suppose an early parametric method of classifying form and structure through um, pattern identification and mathematical uh, relativism. Um, Alberti's definition of architecture is a pattern based mathematical, authorial and holographic uh, a discipline held sway, I suppose, until about the early 20th century, influencing the likes of Christopher Alexander, um, Giles Deleuze, and also Patrick Schumacher, amongst others. Oops. Um, building on the mathematical basis of pattern discovery through human uh, cognition, machine learning developed as early as the, you know, the 1930s, introduced computers as a medium to, to compare data sets to Uh, sorry, Mr. Fagan, are you are you there? Oops, I'm trying to, but I think he got disconnected somehow. He's back now. I can see him on the screen. Okay. Hi there, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes. We, yeah, lost, we lost you for a moment. Yeah. Yes. Yes, welcome back. back. Welcome back. Let me start again. So, um, yeah, machine learning, um, and a useful example of that, as we've spoken uh, or heard from Stanislas uh, today, where he uses pix to pix HD um, in this instance to order uh, and generate new designs for apartment floor plans. And really, the value of this work is both in proof of concept, um, but also by learning from the human intelligence already applied to the design of the data sets. And that's an important differentiation. But as with all machine learning, the process poses really important questions in relation to authenticity, bias, intellectual property rights, and the role of the designer as well. And I think it's useful to just look at some of those um, points. So onto authenticity. Um, so this is Greg Lynn's 2003, sorry, this isn't Greg Lynn's, Greg Lynn's 2003 series of 99 teapots, and this, which is Bernard Cash's 2005 projective tables, feature items that are identical, say for alterations to form, color, or geometry. So in this project, which is Bernard uh, Cash's project, this is achieved through changes to parametric design variation, where each buyer is able to input individual lengths and angles to customize the design before fabrication. In Greg Lynn's project, um, parametric um, incremental alterations to form provided infinitesimally small variations to a collection. And what both these works represent, I think, is the departure from a process determined by the repeatable or identifiable. It's a move instead to a future of design uh, providing total control over indistinguishable difference. So each of Lynn's teapots are different in a small, but definable way, making the object both the same, i.e. it still belongs to a collection, but also unique as well. And this drift of the mass customized machine made copy to that of bespoke individualization leads us away from the identity and autocratic reign of the author to celebrate instead ownership of an object for which design authorship 
begins to become irrelevant. And the unlimited variances of digitally controlled differential reproduction through machine learning will begin to have similar consequences. So in the co uh, historical context of reproduction, authorship depended on identicality. So for example, in the process of, of appraisal for antique dealers or appraisers. Conversely, in the new world, differential and reproducibility is replaced by similarity, fundamentally skewing the role of authenticity through the process of author amalgamation. This signals a move away from the autocratic architect to a hybridized mass informed design process. It signals the dawn of a multi-connected society in which knowledge and data is accessed inst instantaneously across global communities. However, it should be stated that the ability to instantly access and share unfiltered fact and opinion can come at significant cost, which brings me on to um, bias. And all. Uh, so as we know, we've heard uh, machine learning is prone to being stuck in feedback loops, which can end up perpetuating bias. And it's been proven that assumptive data that incorporates unconscious or even conscious bias can spiral into an echo chamber of highly discriminatory um, outcomes, e.g. the uh, Twitter box. Bot. So, for example, a data set of repeat floor plans that indicate window locations will be biased by orientation, local climate, when and where the sun rises and sets, and this detail of contextual bias will not be explicitly described in a data set. So, how do we um, avoid bias in machine learning? Well, one set solution is to regulate training data sets. So, this is the EU document announced recently, which I'm sure you've all read very, very carefully. Um, the good thing for researchers, though, is in its framework, the, uh, the Commission adopts an innovation friendly approach for non high risk AI systems. And then, on to a slightly different subject. So, somewhat conversely, one of the the potential issues I think of uh, machine learning data sets is also stagnation. So reuse and recycling of existing data with little or no new knowledge uh, or creative spark introduced organically risks novelty. So the technological or inspirational jumps evidenced in historic universal new styles. So for example, mass production for modernism and appointed arch for Gothic provided the kind of um, unique context for stylistic adoption. On the other hand, you could argue a building trained on a data set of itself will look like itself. And then onto intellectual property, which has been spoken about a little bit today. So those who use copyrighted works to train an AI system, resulting in a demonstrably reproduced whole or substantial parts may well be liable for copyright infringement. In the case of this, the next Rembrandt, um, a project that used Rembrandt's paintings uh, to create a new one, the infringement analysis would be complicated by the team's goal of producing work that could be attributed to Rembrandt stylistically. Um, courts have previously found that infringement will not be pursued if similarity goes no far further than the use of similar style, color, subject matter, and technique, the key word being similar as opposed to identical. And then on to my last uh, example, Damon uh, Ryle and Noah Rubin produced an interesting project where they just did the limits of AI. So they generated uh, every possible combination of eight note, 12 beat melodies, making it, uh, and then copyrighted them. Um, Damien Ryle went on to state that uh, maybe if these numbers have existed since the beginning of time, um, and we're just plucking them out, maybe melody is just math, which is just facts, which is not copyrightable. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm pretty skeptical about the defense that speculates all patterns have existed in all perpetuity. But regardless, I suppose, of this skepticism, what remains is that this is a, a developing legal area that requires greater definition. So in conclusion, I've discussed how um, machine learning can provide a, a means of learning at scale from human training, trained data, but that it comes at the cost of authenticity bias, stagnation, and complex intellectual property issues. My plea is for both architects and educators of architects to, to familiarize themselves with these issues to avoid the pitfalls that before most adoption of black box uh, technologies. Um, I hope I've demonstrated the link of these issues to authorship and propose that architects must, must position themselves at the forefront of the process of machine learning for design, i.e. to maintain relevance, architects should begin to position themselves as the author of the program rather than simply a contributor to the data set. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Des Fragan, very interesting. Um, um, 
something what what definitely struck me and, and is also a bit close closer to my heart is um, uh, your example about uh, uh, music um, and and uh, this is definitely something that I've, uh, I've looked into how uh, music is is being uh, or new music is being written by uh, uh, AI tools and such. Um, 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 but but maybe in, in, in uh, from from your point of view, what what um, what can you see as a, some kind of an outcome of this? Because of course, uh, I I also believe that music is um, based on, on on let's say principles and mathematics and patterns, and then um, it's just a, a matter of um, sort of. Uh, reassembling them and then you have uh, let's say the aspect of artistic qualities of the performer which makes the, the musical piece uh, unique in some way um, um, so what if, what if what, what happens if this is, is being taken over by uh, AI tools and such mm. in, in your opinion yeah it's it's a very well it's a really tricky one I suppose that the interesting thing to me is of course the music the music of happy birthday you know the tune it was a copyrighted um tune for a long long time and in terms of you know films or or any any profitable works if they included that song they'd be liable to pay copyright you know to, to the original authors which i think in some way kind of spoils the creative endeavor of the the thing in the first place so i think i was discussing this last night i i think what we've got to be careful as creatives is that we don't give too much creative endeavor to the the legal um and the lawyer um uh, interpretation of our creative outputs and if you look at the way in which things are moving at the moment the real winners and the real winners in the near future will be if we're not careful the, the lawyers and the administrators. So I think we've got to find a, a, a better way around this. Quite how we do it, I've got no idea. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jess. I'm quickly gonna uh, look into the Q&A.